and welcome back my AP Calc BC friends. We're going to take a look at example three now from our fictitious topic 6.15. We're still kind of knee deep in this idea of evaluating a trigonometric integral and we're still focusing on the ones that involve sine and cosine. And we're going to take a little bit of a sort of a detour of the kinds of things that we would see in a trigonometric integral with this example. And I've entitled this one, Where's the Sign? Where is the sign? Sign, is it gone? Well, let's take a look. Let's take a look at what this example, that's why it says, where's the sign? We're gonna take a look at integrating cosine to the fourth power. And so while you see this, um, it's, it's very easy to, to dismiss this as being just some trivial antiderivative. Um, it's often the case that some students might want to say this, please avoid the temptation to do this because it's wrong on so many different levels. You can't employ the power rule when you don't have just a simple power and you have this trigonometric word. So we're gonna to have to think about this a little bit more. And if you watched either of the last two videos, we talked about the fact that you would have an odd power of sine or cosine, how you would peel away one of those factors so that you have an even power and it's much easier to work with because we have these wonderful trig identities, right? Well, if there's no odd exponents to peel away, then we're sort of stuck with dealing with our cosine to the fourth power. And so we're going to go ahead and do that and think about how that's going to be modified. And so this cosine to the fourth, while we won't peel away odd or a factor to the first power, we're just going to break it into two separate second powers of cosine. Now, why on earth would we want to do something like that? That seems like it's very much overcomplicated things. Well, it actually hasn't because we have a trig identity that we're going to be able to work here now. And this trig identity um, involves the cosine squared. And it's just a derivation of the half angle identities that had been mentioned in, in video number one of this series. And so if we see the cosine squared of theta, we know that we can just rewrite that as one plus the cosine of two theta all divided by two. Now, again, I'm not going to use this video to derive where that comes from. Uh, I can uh, direct you to many videos on the internet. There's so many uh, well-documented trigonometric identity videos out there that will talk you through this. But we want to be very confident and comfortable with that particular identity. Cosine squared is 1 plus the cosine of 2 theta all divided by 2. So what are we going to do with this? We are going to replace each of these cosine squareds with that very expression. And so we write that up and we see it all coming together here. One plus cosine of two theta all divided by two times itself. Now at this point what we can do is think about the next direction that we go. Think about well, the variables that I used, well, I'm not going to use theta because that's just silly. So let's use x's in both of these instances because that's the variable that we're going to focus on and think about what's going to happen next. So fortunately or unfortunately, however you want to look at it, what we are going to have to do is we're going to have to expand these. We are going to have to multiply these two expressions together to get this into a, a state that we're going to be able to integrate. Now, in doing that, we can go ahead and multiply the twos in the denominator, create a one-fourth that's going to be our factor out in front. And then the expansion inside will give us one plus. We got cosine of 2x multiplied by 1, added a couple of times. So that would be 2 cosine 2x, of course. And then cosine 2x times itself would be cosine squared of 2x all dx. And so at this point, we have to then consider our next course of action. And we have to keep in mind, you know, where are we at in this process? What can we integrate correctly, successfully, and what can't we integrate? And so as we move through, the 1 doesn't seem to be a problem. Very easy to integrate. And the 2 cosine 2x won't be much of an issue. 
But it's this cosine squared of 2x that, yep, is a bit of an issue, unfortunately. And so what that basically says to us is that we're going to have to employ this identity one more time. This identity that said cosine squared of theta has this equivalency. We're now going to think of it as the cosine squared of 2 times that theta. And if you think about if this argument here is simply doubled on the left side of the equation, we can use the idea of substitution and double it on the right side. And so this cosine of 2 theta is like the cosine of 2 times 2 theta, still all over 2. And so when we finally simplify this, we could get 1 plus the cosine of 4 theta over 2. And that's what we're going to use to replace this third term. And after that, things really start to fall into place. It definitely takes a, a while to get there. There's a lot of very, very somewhat complex identity work. I'm not going to deny that. Now, this 1 plus cosine 4 theta over 2, prior to replacing this, I'm going to suggest that we split that apart into two separate integrals or two separate expressions that will end up being two separate antiderivatives that we take. And so now we are all set. Again, I'm going to choose to change my variables to x to, for convenience in this particular problem. And I take inventory. What do I have here? Well, I have four terms, each of which are quite easy to anti-differentiate. And so what do you say we do it? The antiderivative of 1 with respect to x, of course, is x. This 2 is going to drop straight down. But when we integrate cosine of 2x, don't forget, we've got a bit of a u substitution happening here. If u is 2x, that results in a derivative of 2, of course, which means we're going to have to offset with a reciprocal 1 half. That essentially will wipe out the 2 that's already there. And we end up with just the antiderivative of cosine, which is sine, and then the 2x falls into place. I'm going to go ahead and put parentheses around things to kind of keep them nice and organized here. All right, so we're halfway through these four terms. We're going to go ahead and do the same thing with our 1 half now. So when we take the antiderivative of this um, 1 half, we're going to get 1 half x. And then finally, we, we're up to the final term, this cosine of 4x over 2. The 1 half might come out in front, and I'll tell you what, we'll go ahead and make it come out in front. The u substitution here is going to be very similar to what we did up above. u is going to be 4x. The derivative is 4, offset with a 1 fourth. And so we're going to have a half joined by a 1 fourth. And then, of course, when you integrate cosine, you get positive sine. And that would be with our 4x. And then once we finish out that term, we can add our plus c. And essentially, I think we've got uh, a solution here. Now, I would like to investigate this just a little bit further. I'd like to see, uh, is this uh, solution sound? Does it check using a computer algebra system? Notice I didn't combine like terms. I suppose I could have done that. Maybe we'll discuss that here. Let's go ahead and say, hey, if we combine our x and our 1 half x, we, of course, would get 3 halves x. But outside of that, not much more that we're going to be able to do to make this look much prettier. Uh, we can multiply the 1 half and the 1 fourth, and we can come up with this. So there we go. Is this answer going to be correct? Well, let's find out. Let's look at a computer algebra system. All right, so here we are with our CASC uh, computer algebra system, and we are going to go ahead and take a look <clears throat> at what is that antiderivative? What if we took our integration of cosine to the fourth power of uh, uh, <clears throat> this particular function? So we have cosine of x all raised to the fourth. Now, when you do enter that, make sure that you wrap the entire cosine of x in parentheses. Calculator won't like it otherwise. And might I point out that you want to be in radians. This is very important. So if we integrate that, we get something that you probably can immediately see that doesn't look quite like what you had on, on paper. Um, 
deviates just a little bit, maybe you could manipulate this and factor and, and see if it uh, has any kind of merit to it. But what I'm going to do instead is go to a graphing page and I'm going to take our original answer that we just computed by pencil and paper. And I sketch that and it turns out that it's equivalent or it's sketch looks like this red curve right there. And so what I'm going to do at this point is I'm going to go in and I'm going to highlight so that I can copy control C that expression. Make sure that I copied it here. Control C. And then I'm going to go back into my page one, two, bring up my graph entry line, and I'm going to I'm going to graph that entire expression in the F2 menu. And I think I may have already uh, had that graph, but just or had that pasted in. But I want to make sure here. So Control V pastes that, and if I hit Enter, I find out that I indeed have the same curves. And I think I could kind of illustrate that if I open up this graph entry line. There's the red graph. There's the blue graph. The original pencil and paper solution, and then that's the solution that our graphing calculator gave us. So again, we know that we have the right answer because they have the same curves. Definitely a challenging integration problem. I'm not going to deny that. But so much of the challenge is just tied to the trig identity. So don't let that stand in your way. Learn those trig identities. Uh, be comfortable with them. Be able to manipulate them. And you'll find out that these trig integrals maybe aren't as bad as you think. Anyway, I hope this helps out. We'll see you next time.